as we continue in this series much more the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in this passage of Scripture, what we have is a list of gifts that the Lord gave to His church for the purpose of leadership. Now, we live in a generation that I think does not feel that leadership is as important as it really is. But the truth is, leadership is incredibly important, uh, whether it's in the family, or whether it's in a business, or whether it's in the church, or whether it's in uh, Washington, D.C. Leadership is incredibly important to our personal success. And so what we have in Ephesians 4 is the gifts of leadership that the Lord gave to the early church. And so I'm going to read this for you, and then we're going to talk about each one of these gifts of leadership that the Lord gave to the early church. And <clears throat> I think that uh, by the time we get to the end of this message, that God will speak to you through this message in a very significant way. So let's read this together. It's in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. The Bible says, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and then I want you to notice that he said, and some pastors and teachers. He didn't say, and some pastors and some teachers. He said, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love, which Brandon so eloquently spoke about last Sunday. Ultimately, the goal of the gifts of leadership is to equip the saints for the work of ministry that we might grow up into the image of Jesus. And if you want to know what the image of Jesus looks like, it's found in the last word of verse 16. It's love. If you want one word to sum up, what it means to grow up in Christ, it means to grow up in God's love. Well, in the early church, the Lord gave gifts to some men to be servant leaders in the church. He did not choose them to be authoritarian leaders who were leading for their own benefit. They were servant leaders, and he chose some to give to be leaders, and he gave them gifts to be leaders. And these particular leaders were specifically chosen and gifted by the Holy Spirit to help build, I want you to remember that word, build, it's another word for equip, to build the church. Now Paul, in this passage of Scripture, he identified these leaders by their office by their office. Their office included a very specific way that they were, were responsible to serve or lead the church. The early church understood these titles. I doubt if you're new to the church that you have any clue about what these titles mean. I mean, if we went to a foreign country and we began to talk to someone from that country, there's many countries I could go to and they would begin to tell me who their leaders were by title. And I wouldn't know what they were talking about. Because the titles they were using would be different than the titles we use in our country. And so if you're new to the church and you see these titles that Paul used here in Ephesians 4, you may not know or understand what these titles mean. If I said to you, okay, uh, you know, 
we're uh, in the United States, we have a president. Well, most all of you would know immediately what the responsibility of that person was. Or if I said in, in the state of Oklahoma, we have a governor, you would immediately know what that means for the state of Oklahoma. Or if I said, yeah, the mayor of Oklahoma City, you would understand that title and you would understand the role and the responsibilities of that particular person based upon the title that they have. And so in this passage of Scripture, Paul is listing these titles, but he doesn't go into explanation of what the responsibilities and roles were for these different leaders in the church. Those titles were apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastors slash teachers. Well, what was the responsibility of these different leaders? I mean, what, what does it mean to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's very important that we understand what these roles were in the early church. Well, first of all, the apostles. Let's talk about them. They established the beliefs and practices of the church. A very important role. They established the beliefs and the practices of the church. They determined what the church should believe and what the church should practice. Now, Jesus was the first apostle in his church, but he appointed other men to carry on his work in his church after he ascended into heaven, and those men were called the apostles. The apostles were also church planters, church planters. They traveled to places where the gospel had never been heard, and they would reside in those places for just a season. Sometimes it was just uh, a, a few weeks, sometimes it was months, sometimes it was several years, but it was always just a, a season. And these apostles would reside in those places, they would win new converts, and then they would organize a church in that place that they went. They were church planners. The, the apostles were gifted by the Holy Spirit to function in all the other offices listed in Ephesians 4. In other words, the apostles could prophesy, and they did in the Scripture. The apostles were definitely evangelists, right? And then certainly the apostles were pastors, teachers. But the main role of the apostles was that they were the divinely inspired authority on what the church should believe and how those beliefs were to be applied in practice. Now, where do we find this in the Scripture? Well, we find it in the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, and it's talking about his disciples that he had spent so much time with. He said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. But he didn't stop there. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. All things, he said. And then he said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This was the great commissioning of the church, but this was the great commissioning of these apostles to be the authority on what the beliefs and practices of the church of Jesus should be. That's why when the church was finally born at Pentecost, the Bible tells us in Acts 2.42, and they, meaning the church, continued steadfastly, and it doesn't say in the, you know, the Bible's doctrine. It says in the apostles' doctrine. And the reason it says that is because they were the recognized authority to determine what the church should believe and what the church should practice. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says in verse 1, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us. Notice the authority that he's asserting. The commandment of us. Peter said, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, we are blessed because we have a record of these beliefs and practices that the apostles taught to the church in our Bible. The apostles were the ones, because they were the authority when it came to what the church should believe and practice, the apostles had the authority to settle any dispute in the church over what the church should believe and how those beliefs were to be applied in practice. They were the recognized authority by the Lord Jesus Christ. In their epistles or letters, which we have in the New Testament, they exercised their authority on all kinds of issues. They told the church, listen, this is what you should believe. And then they would say, this is how you should practice that belief in this particular circumstances. So, for example, we have in Acts 15 and then we have in Galatians, we have uh, the apostles and specifically Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. He is addressing the whole issue of whether or not the Gentiles needed to be circumcised or not. Now, why was he doing that? Because he had the authority to determine what the church should believe and what the church should practice when it came to the issue of circumcision among the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, it is the Apostle Paul who settles a dispute over head coverings and whether or not women should wear head coverings in the church or not. And he settles that issue for the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, why did he do that? Because he was the one, as the apostle, who had the authority to settle those disputes. Now, to establish their authority, Jesus did something for these apostles. First of all, he allowed them to be witnesses of his resurrection. And that gave them a measure of authority as the apostles who were going to determine what the church should believe and practice. But something else he did for them is that he gave them an ability to perform signs and wonders. That's how Jesus established their credibility as those who were to determine the beliefs and practices of the early church. And so the apostle Paul, knowing that he was chosen to be an apostle and had been a witness of the resurrection. And then also, he knew that he had been given this incredible gift to perform signs and wonders. When he's writing letters like to the Corinthian church, he says to the Corinthian church, Listen, I know that when I'm with you, my speech is rather weak. But I want to remind you of my power, of my gifting that I have. I mean, it was not an idle threat. It was a warning that he could deal through supernatural uh, signs and wonders with people in the church that were creating problems in the church. Now, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> to be able to exercise that kind of authority when someone was out of line. He said, let me pray for you. Would you let me pray for you? And if I prayed for you, God was going to go, something was going to happen if I prayed for it to happen, right? And that's the kind of authority that he gave to these apostles. The apostles and their interpretation of the prophets in the Old Testament formed the foundation for the construction of a healthy church. I want you to remember that. The apostles, what they taught, what they believed, how they applied the practices to the church, it formed the foundation for a healthy church. And that's why in Ephesians 2, a couple of chapters earlier than Ephesians 4, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, he said that the church was built on what? In verse 20, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, these these writings that we have of the apostles' teachings, their doctrines, are called Scripture. And Scripture just simply means, if you're new to the church, it means document. It's what it literally means. Nothing really sacred about that word. It could be used in other contexts. But it meant document. 
and it forms the foundation for the building of a healthy church in much the same way that the founding fathers of our nation wrote the Constitution of the United States as a foundation for a healthy nation. And here's the truth in America, if you're an American citizen, young people, you need to understand this. If we began to drift from that Constitution, we're not going to be a healthy nation. And let me tell you, we have drifted. We have drifted away from the Constitution of the United States as the foundation of our government in the United States. And we're not a healthy nation right now as a result of that drifting. And the same thing happens in the church. When a church, a local church, begins to drift away from that foundation of the apostles' doctrines, the church begins to become unhealthy in its beliefs and ultimately in its practices. And the result of that is it's going to bring great damage to the reputation of Jesus in the lost world. The lost world is going to, going to begin to believe things about Jesus because of what the church is teaching that are not true. And it's going to damage the reputation of Jesus within our community if we ever drift from that foundation that the apostles and prophets have laid for us. Any member of the church that rejects or contradicts the foundation that the apostles laid should be rebuked. And that goes for myself as an elder teacher in this church. If I drift away from that foundation of the Bible as far as what the apostles laid, I need to be rebuked by the other elders in the church. It's so critical for any church to be healthy that we stick to the foundation that needs to be laid. In fact, if I was off and the elders rebuked me and I, I re, wouldn't repent of their rebuke, they should be, I should be considered a dangerous, false teacher and heretic within the church. In other words, it would be enough uh, based upon what I just said for me to be removed. If I drift from that foundation which the apostles laid. And so that was the primary role of the apostles. And what an incredible foundation the apostles have laid for us in the church of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the second group of leaders in the early church were called the prophets. Now here's what the prophets did for the church is they gave vision to the church. Once again, the first prophet in the church of Jesus was Jesus himself. And we have all kinds of prophecies that he gave uh, within the four Gospels. But Jesus, after he ascended into heaven, he appointed other men to carry out this work of prophecy within the church. And I'm not just talking about people that have received the gift, whether it's men or women, the gift of prophecy. I'm talking about an office of prophecy in the church. Now, it's not as clear in the New Testament this particular office is not as clearly spelled out for us as the office of apostle is. But what we do know from the few examples that we have about those who served in this office is that these prophets, they received specific revelation from God about where the church should expand. And I'm going to share a couple of illustrations of that in just a moment. I mean, if we were going to plant a new church somewhere in Oklahoma City, where should we plant it? Well, in the early church, they looked to the prophets. Go hear from God. Tell us, what should we do? Because there's a lot of different opportunities that we could take advantage of. And so the prophets of God in the New Testament church, uh, they would prophesy about where the church should expand. They gave vision. They would prophesy about future events that were going to happen in the world order. In the New Testament. Wouldn't that be incredible? These prophets in the church, they had the ability at times to discern the secret sins of other people within the church. Now, who would like to be around a person who could discern that about you? Wow. What a powerful office was the office of prophet. 
couple examples that we have in Scripture. One, it, a couple of them are about the same person. His name is Agabus. In Acts chapter 11, it says that Agabus prophesied. He stood up and he showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. He predicted this future event. Now, why was that important? And it goes on to say that it actually happened in the days of Claudius Caesar's. Well, what it did was, if you know something's going to happen, it should affect your plans. I mean, if you know that a tornado is coming, I hope that it would affect your plans if you were in the path of that tornado. Thank you. And the same was happening here in the early church. It was to direct the church on its preparations of what it should do in order to prepare for this famine that was going to happen. In Acts chapter 13, it says, Now in the church there was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now this is coming through those prophets. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. That's pretty specific prophecy, isn't it? Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And then in Acts 21 it says, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet, once again his name is Agabus, came from Judea. And when he came to us, he did this unusual thing physically. He took Paul's belt. I, I would have liked to have seen that. Paul was standing there, and I don't know what that belt looked like, but suddenly he just reached over and he took Paul's belt from him. You know, I don't know what that belt was supporting. It could have been embarrassing if it was me. <laughs> but he took his belt, and it said he bound his hands and his feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Well, that's exactly what took place, right? To the Apostle Paul. And Agabus prophesied and he prepared Paul and the church, because Paul was very vital to the church, about what was going to happen to the Apostle Paul. So the prophets were critical to the construction of a healthy church upon the foundation that was laid by the apostles. And why, once again, the apostles could operate in prophecy, and they did. The apostle Paul warned the church at Thessalonica not to extinguish the spirit. Get that. You can extinguish the spirit by despising prophetic utterances, but you're supposed to test these prophets. Because Why? Well, you're supposed to test those who are preaching the apostles' doctrine. Well, to do that, what do you do? Well, just, we have the Bible. You can just open up the Bible and see if what I'm saying is true or not. You can search it out for yourself. But when it came to these prophecies about the future events, it says that you're supposed to test those prophecies that are given, and then you're supposed to hold on to that which is good. Any church that despises prophetic utterances will be very limited in its power is what happens. That's what happened in the early church. You know, I, I see this occur frequently in local churches where there's just nobody who has any vision for the church. There's no prophecy going on about where the church should go or where the church should grow. And what happens to those local churches when they don't have that kind of vision is that it really limits their power and the expansion of those churches. I mean, I've also seen it, though, happen in people's personal lives who are believers, who show contempt for prophetic utterances. They extinguish the Spirit in their own personal lives because they despise prophetic utterances. So it's very important that we as a church don't do that when it comes to prophecy. Pardon me. Next one that we have is the evangelist. Very important office in the early church. 
They led the lost to join the church, is what the evangelists did. And once again, who was the first evangelist in the church? Well, Jesus was the first evangelist in the church. He began to evangelize right away in Matthew chapter 4, 19. He said, follow me to some men, and I will make you fishers of men. But he also appointed other men and others to carry on his work in the church. The evangelist was given the ability to preach the gospel to the lost in a way that would create within the lost an urgency to be saved from sin. And it would create within them a conviction that Jesus was the only one who could save them. That's what the evangelist was gifted to do. And so we have uh, an example of that in Acts chapter 8, where Philip, Philip, who was a deacon, became an evangelist in the church. He obtained to this office within the church. And as Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord, they heeded the things which was spoken by Philip, hearing, it says, and seeing the miracles which he was able to perform. So the Lord Jesus also gave that gift of performing signs and wonders to some of these evangelists. Wow, that would be incredible, wouldn't it? To be able to uh, establish your credibility for the gospel of Jesus by healing someone that was ill right on the spot, you know? Not after weeks and months or even years in prayer, but just right on the spot. Say, okay, now do you believe? Well, that's what authority these evangelists had in the early church. It says in Acts 21.8, On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist. He's now identified not just by his being one of the first seven deacons in the church, but he's identified as Philip and the evangelist. So the evangelist was critical to the numerical growth and the expansion of the church. Not only did they win the loss, but they, they would stir up the motivation of the church to be disciples who won the lost. And they also showed the church, which we all need to be shown, this is how you present the gospel right here. This is how you present the, the gospel of Jesus. Any church that rejects the work of the evangelist will struggle uh, to add new converts to its congregation. And uh, this particular gift, the gift of evangelism, is still very much alive today in the body of Christ. But there are many churches that are rejecting the evangelist now and not welcoming the evangelist into their midst. And that's going to cause the church to suffer when it comes to reaching new converts. And then you have the office of pastor teachers. Now, what did they do? Pastor teachers discipled the church. Once again, Jesus was the first teacher in the church, but he appointed others to carry out his work in the church. And while the evangelist focused his ministry on winning new converts, the pastor teacher focused on helping new converts mature and fulfill their ministry in the church. They, these apostles, I mean, these pastor teachers in the early church, they were, they had this, uh, they were gifted with this ability to ground the church in the apostles' doctrine. They had the ability to illumine the truth of Scripture in a way that was never before seen by the listeners. They revealed the mind of God based upon the apostles' doctrine. They had this insight and a way to communicate those insights that would really grab the heart of those who had believed so that they could mature in the faith. They gave the church understanding of truth that they were uh, sorely lacking. We have an example of that, a real clear example of this in the scripture. Uh, and I'm going to breeze through these scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul said, who was an apostle, I sent Timothy to you. Timothy was a pastor teacher in the early church. Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ. What's he doing? He's grounding the church in the apostles' doctrine that Paul had presented to the church at Corinth. And he goes on to say, as I teach everywhere in the church. And then in Philippians, notice again, it mentions Timothy. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Here's another church. This is the, Corinth is one place, Philippians is another, that I 
also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verse 1, so you had the Corinthian church, Timothy was sent there. You have the Philippian church, Timothy was sent there. Now you have the church at Thessalonica. He said, therefore, Paul said, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to what? establish you and encourage you you see what he's doing that was his role as the pastor teacher and then in first timothy one paul has written a letter directly to timothy and he says as i urged you when i went to macedonia remain in ephesus now look at that i mean timothy got around that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine see what the pastor teacher does he grounds the people in the doctrine of the apostles. In the early church, leaders in the church who fulfilled these roles, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they had an itinerant ministry. Notice even Timothy as a pastor teacher. I identified him in four different churches, and I'm sure there were many more that he was sent to to help the church get grounded in the apostles' doctrine. These people that served as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers, they did not settle in one place like I've done for the last 37 or more years. They didn't do that. They didn't settle in one local congregation. They were a blessing to the entire body of Christ, and they went where the Holy Spirit sent them to build up the church. They were itinerant preachers traveling from place to place and church to church. In fact, I can't find one example in the New Testament of any person that was in one of these four offices that I went over with you today who spent their life serving just one local church. They were too valuable to be limited to one local church. The body of Christ needed them at large, and so they were always on the move. Well, since these leaders were always on the move, what was going to be the plan for leadership in the local church? Since these guys were in and they were out, I mean, even if they were staying for more than a year, they were still in and out, right? What was the plan? Well, the plan was a good one. Since these leaders were in and out and always on the move, elders were appointed to the local churches is what happened. Elders were appointed and we have a list of the qualifications of elders in Titus chapter 1 and verses 5 through 9. And I would encourage you to read through those qualifications of elders. What did elders do in the church? Well, elders fulfilled the role of bishop and shepherd in a local church is what elders did. Now, all of those who served in those four or five-fold ministry giftings that I mentioned to you or those offices, they were all recognized as elders in the church. But what I'm talking about now is the local elders that those fellows appointed to lead the church after they left. And so these local elders fulfilled the role of bishop and shepherd in the local church. The word bishop means officer in charge of, or superintendent. I mean, this morning you came here to this service, somebody planned it. It was your elder who planned it. In this case, it would have been Brandon who planned it. And he planned the order of this service. He, super, he was acting as a bishop, because that's what the word bishop means. It means one who is a superintendent. And you have appointed him to serve in that role to be a bishop for you and to organize things on your behalf. But also, they were shepherds. Shepherd means to feed. Not, that's what elders do. We superintend and we feed. We nurture the people with the word of the Lord, and that's what I'm doing for you today. Another word for shepherd, and it's not to be confusing, is pastor. Elders were pastors. They were bishops and shepherds, and shepherds means pastors. Now, to qualify to be an elder, a man had to be able to teach. It's important. You gotta be able to teach to feed the people, right? And not only be able to teach, it said they had to be men of good character. And it gives these very specific details of how to recognize those that have good character that should be serving the church at elders. 
Now, elders was a gender-specific role limited to men in the New Testament. And the elders were responsible to lead the church to carry out what they had learned from the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. It was their job to organize the church and to shepherd the church toward maturity in Christ. In other words, to help you grow up into the image of Jesus, just like we read in Ephesians 4, the elders were left to do that with each local congregation. If there was one elder who was, and this wasn't always the truth, there wasn't always an elder who was first among equals who was chosen to do most of the teaching in a local church. That was not that way always in the New Testament church. But if there was one who was a first among equals, he was to be rewarded. And in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, the Bible talks about that reward or that honoring that should be given to those elders that work hard at the word and doctrine. Another Another role within the church that we're very familiar with in our church to enable the elders to focus on their spiritual leadership of the church or their spiritual superintending of the church, which I'm telling you is an incredible amount of work to superintend the spiritual leadership of a local church, and then also to feed the flock, to enable the elders to focus on that, there, was chosen to serve, there were those who were cho chosen to serve as deacons. And this first happened in the early church in, uh, in the book of Acts, very early in the book of Acts, when there were some material needs of Grecian widows that were being neglected. And so the solution to the problem was they would appoint seven men, the church appointed seven men that would help with those more material needs in order to free up the apostles at that time, were the main elders of that church in Jerusalem, to focus upon what? Bishoping the church and uh, feeding the church from the doctrines that they had gained from the Holy Spirit. And these deacons also had to be men of good character, and, uh, but they didn't have to be able to teach. It's interesting, it's not part of the qualification if you read about it in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. And we're certainly blessed to have a wonderful group of elders and deacons serving in our local church. They work so well together. And, uh, you know, uh, you can tell how we work well together by what gets accomplished. Uh, but also, you can tell how we work well together by the, you know, the absence of conflict. Uh, whenever someone is serving in an office or when someone is serving in a particular role of responsibility in the church, it can always create potential conflicts within the office. Now, let me share a few conclusions with you, and then we'll be done with this this morning. First conclusion or observation that I want to share with you this morning is that Jesus' plan for the leadership of his church should cause even the greatest skeptic to believe that he's Lord. Now, I'm going to explain that to you. Here's Jesus founding a new religion. A new religion. He's one man. He's founding a new religion that he wants to live on for perpetuity, forever. Okay? Well, Jesus did not physically write the constitution of his own organization. Most would call that poor leadership. I mean, Jesus did not write the New Testament. Physically. If you go and you began to read the, uh, the foundation documents of other religions, you're going to find that their founder wrote the documents for the most part. Well, Jesus, we, we don't have anything written that he recorded. There was others that recorded it for him, but he didn't spend time writing down the Constitution physically of his own organization. He left that up to his disciples after his death. Now, how in the world is something like that going to succeed? You tell me. You see, he left that up to his disciples after his death to form that constitution that we now call the New Testament, and it took 382 years. Think about that. It took 382 years for what we call the New Testament to be officially branded as inspired by God at a particular church council that took place in Rome. Let me ask you, how well do you think we would operate without a New Testament? Well, the early church operated without one for 382 years. Think about that. It took another 300 years for that particular uh, 
canon of Scripture, as we call it, to be formalized in all Orthodox churches, and that happened at a council in a place called Trulon in 692. So the entire church didn't even embrace the New Testament canon. That's why I laugh when someone says the gifts passed away when the canon was... Which one? Oh, did it happen? You tell me. Did it happen in 382 or did it happen in 692? I don't know. But isn't it amazing that the church would even get off the ground and not only get off the ground but flourish? And it didn't even have a constitution written that could be handed to every believer. We have that today. Another reason why Jesus' plan for the leadership of his church should cause even the greatest skeptic to believe that he's sovereign, and when I say Lord, I mean sovereign, is that he did not leave one man to be in charge. I mean, what kind of leadership is that? I mean, he put 13 men in charge. Now, just think about how that would work at Reaching Souls, Ben, or how would that work out at Kimray, or how would that work in any organization? How would that work at Santa Fe South School? I'm looking at people out here that it wouldn't work very well. How would that work at Hobby Lobby if they didn't have one person that was left to be in charge? Jesus left 13 people to be in charge. Incredible when you think about it. And then, he did not choose the most educated people to be leaders. In fact, we could only really say that the only one who was greatly educated was the Apostle Paul, who happened to write the majority of the New Testament when it was all said and done. And so it wasn't that education wasn't important, but when Jesus was choosing leaders, he was just choosing these ordinary guys that were fishermen and tax collectors and guys who hadn't been trained to be leaders. And then you know what he didn't do? Jesus did not outline a plan for succession and leadership. I mean, all of us know that that's very important to any organization and institution that you outline a plan of succession for leadership. And Jesus did not do that. Well, despite all of these apparent omissions, the church of Jesus not only survived the first century, but it has thrived. In fact, there have been more converts to Christianity than to any other religion in the history of the world. And so anyone who's skeptical should go, well, how in the world did that happen? Well, I'll tell you the way it happened. Jesus is Lord is the way it happened. He is sovereign. That's the only way this could have happened. Here's the second observation I want to make. Recognition, recognition of these roles of leadership, choosing the right leaders and enabling them to carry out their service to the church was critical to the success of the early church. It's absolutely critical. And you know what? It's still critical today. You know, it was very difficult for the early church to know who they should follow. We see that in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. Should we follow Peter? Should we follow Paul? Should we follow Paul? Who should we follow? It was very difficult for the early church to know who they should follow as a leader. But you need to understand this about where we're at today. There's never been a time in the history of the church when it has been more difficult for the disciples of Jesus to know what leaders to follow. I mean, 60 years ago, 60 years ago I would have been 6 years old. So 60 years ago, do you know there were very few non-denominational churches? Did you know that? 60 years ago? Young people, you probably didn't know that. I mean, non-denominational churches are everywhere today. But 60 years ago, huh, there were very few non-denominational churches. And what non-denominational churches they were, they weren't very successful. If you were a Christian 60 years ago, you belonged to a non-denomination more than likely. You learn from those leaders that were in your denomination. And all of those denominations have differences in certain beliefs as far as their interpretation of what the apostles taught. And so when you wanted to read a book, who did you read? Well, if you were in the Lutheran church, you read the Lutheran people. If you were in the Baptist church, you read the Baptist people. I'm talking about 60 years ago. 
If you were in the Methodist church, you read the Methodist people. That's who you listened to. I mean, denominations had their own bookstores. And you didn't dare, if you were a Methodist, go into Baptist bookstore 60 years ago. 60 years ago, American evangelist Billy Graham was one of the only leaders whose ministry was supported by most Protestant denominations. 60 years ago. Most Protestants, probably except the Church of Christ. 60 years ago. Man, the landscape has changed right now in our nation. There's never been a time in the history of the church when it's been more difficult for elders in any local church to lead their church to listen to the right teachers. And I want you to understand, at times, this has been very discouraging to me. When I listen to who you're listening to, I go, oh my goodness, I can't believe they're listening to them. And I have absolutely no control over it. I mean, and now you can listen to certain teachers just with a push of a button and take in everything they're saying and sometimes what they're saying is not the truth. It's not based upon the apostles' doctrine. It's never been more difficult to know who to follow than it is today. So what do I recommend? Well, I've never made this recommendation before, but I'm going to make it for the next generation. <laughs> Here's what I would recommend. If you're going to listen to or read the teachings of someone other than your own elders in your own local church... Why don't you go and have an open and honest conversation about that teacher and what he or she believes and what he or she teaches? Why not do that with the elders of your local church? Say, so, you know, I've been thinking about reading this book over here by this particular person, and I want to have an open, honest conversation about what they believe. Because, you see, that's what our elders are supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be protecting the flock from false teaching. Many times when I'm ministering to somebody... I see that they've already been so ruined by false teaching, it's going to take an, an incredible amount of time just to unlearn what they've already learned that's false. So why not do that? Why not have that open and honest conversation? Why would you do that, you say? Well, first of all, Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember those who rule over you. It's talking about your local elders now who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. You know us. You know our elders. You know me. You know my conduct. You know how we conduct ourselves among you. You know us. You've appointed us to be your elders because of our conduct that's been tested and has been demonstrated. Why should you place your confidence in anyone to lead you that you don't even know? Does that make any sense at all? I mean, I, I, some people say, I love that Bible teacher. Man, I love that Bible. Do you know them? Do you know their conduct? Because that's what was said to be a credible, credible issue in Hebrews 13, 7. Do you know the way they live? Do you know the way they operate? Do you know the way they treat people? And then in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you. Once again, it's talking about your local elders. And be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. You see, local elders are the ones who watch out for your souls. Those people out there don't watch out for your souls. We are the ones who watch out for your souls. Look over your souls. Pray over your souls. Cry over your souls. And so, right here in Hebrews it says, yeah, you should obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. We earn the right to be your leaders by the way that we care for people, not only by the way that we conduct ourselves, but by the way that we care for you. So if you're going to listen or read the teachings of someone beside your elders, let's have an open and honest conversation about them and what they teach. Maybe it'll help avoid some of the catastrophes that I've seen in the local church when people are believing the wrong things or they're following the wrong person. Last observation is this. There's never been a time in the history of the church in our nation when it's been more critical that men become faithful men and then step forward to lead their local church. You see, right now in the local church in our nation, and I don't know how it is in other nations, but I know how it is in America, there is a shortage of leaders 
in the local church. Now, it's just a reflection of the family. Because there's a shortage of leaders by men in the family. But there's a shortage of leaders in the local church. There are churches right now that haven't had a pastor teacher for years. Because no one will go serve. I mean, it's a pandemic. It's an epidemic. The shortage of leaders in the body of Christ in America is incredible. And some of that has become because of this message this morning. So many have started out in that direction of answering that call to be an elder in the church. And then once they were in it for six months or a year because people didn't understand some of the things I was saying this morning, they became discouraged and just quit. I mean, the average dropout rate for for those who are serving full-time in local churches as elders, especially teaching elders, is incredible. It is listed by Ford's Magazine as one of the most stressful, stressful stressful duties to perform in a church or in, in any kind of occupation. Based on this shortage, my question is, is God calling you to be an elder or deacon in his church? If he is, you need to do what I did. When that call came, it was like my call to salvation. I felt like when I was saved that if I didn't respond to the call of salvation, I was going to be damned immediately for all of eternity. That's the way I felt by the Holy Spirit. It's like, i got to do this now or I'm damned. My call to become a teaching elder in the church was exactly like that. It was a conviction that if I don't do this, my life's not going to go well. It's the way I felt about it. It wasn't like, oh, here's an option for you to look at, Jerry, from the Lord. You know, maybe he'll want you to be a teaching elder in the church. No, no, it came with a roaring conviction. And so what did I do when I felt that conviction? I surrendered. I said, okay, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. I'll do that. And I surrendered on the spot. Is God calling you to be an elder or a deacon in his church? If he is, you just need to surrender to his call. Now, you know what? The moment I surrendered, I wasn't ready. (laughs) Some guys just think, you know, if you'll put me in that position of leadership, I'll become a faithful man. What? What kind of logic is that? Once you surrender to the call... You need to become a faithful man. You need to learn what it means to be a faithful man. You need to be discipled. You shouldn't try to manage others in the church until you are faithful at managing yourself. Too many times we've laid hands upon someone too hastily, only to find out later that they're not managing their life. That should never happen in the local church if we can prevent it. Because it brings such damage to the church and such damage to the reputation of Jesus. No, surrender. Surrender to the call and then say, Lord, what do I need to do to get ready? So that happened to me when I was uh, 17. In the first church I served in, I was, what, 26, seven years later. And by that time, I had been discipled by all kinds of different people, including my professors at uh, undergraduate school and my professors at seminary. All all of it was about learning to be faithful, learning to be faithful, managing myself, and now I can lead others to manage themselves. It was hard. It was hard. I thought, Lord, am I ready now? I remember there was one time I thought I was ready. I'd been in school for nine years. I'd been in undergraduate school and then graduate school, and then I'd been one year at Baylor University, and this church showed an interest in me becoming their pastor. And I, and I was so excited about the possibility of going to this little church in South Dakota. It was about 100 people. It sounded like a great, perfect place for me to go. And uh, we prayed about it. And one night, in the middle of the night, the Lord woke up and I began to weep. Because the Lord said, you're not ready yet. What? You're not, I'm not ready. I've been preparing myself all of these years. 
to be a faithful manager of people as a shepherd and I'm not ready? Lord. And then the Lord directed me the very next day to what I needed to do for the next two years in order to get ready. If God is calling you, surrender yourself to become a faithful man in order to be the leader that God wants you to be in his church. If you believe God's calling you to be a teaching elder in the local church, then what you need to do is you need to pursue the formal training that you need to fulfill your calling. This is not an easy work to do. It's a difficult work to do. But you need to first surrender to the call. Let's pray together this morning. Would you answer God's call to salvation if you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? There's no way the church of Jesus would still be around based upon the way he chose to operate as far as leadership is concerned, apart from the fact that he's just absolutely Lord and sovereign. There's no other explanation. On that, on that particular uh, point alone, you should say, okay, I recognize Jesus as Lord and I receive him to be my Savior. There's nothing like it. In all of world history, there is nothing like the growth and development of Christianity being directed by the sovereign Lord of this universe. Would you receive Jesus as your personal Savior from your sin? You need to. You need to this morning. I pray the Holy Spirit with conviction would come upon you. I pray that he would convict you the way he convicted me, that you need to do this or you're going to be damned. May that happen to you the way it happened to me. Would you receive Jesus if it's happening to you? If the Holy Spirit's convicting you right now, would you respond and say, yes, Lord, I surrender to you for my salvation from sin. Would you answer God's call to follow the leadership that God has established in our church? I mean, we have members of our church that aren't following our leadership. We have members that have signed a church covenant that they would follow our leadership, and they're not following our church co covenant. They don't give, for one. You don't give to support the work once you sign a church covenant. That's part of following the leadership that's been given to you. Would you allow the elders of your church to actually have an opportunity to give input in your life before you make major decisions? Why wouldn't you? That's what we're here for, to shepherd your souls. In some cases, to help you solve your problems. So would you answer God's call to follow the leadership that God has established in our church and all I can do is assure you that we are committed to the Apostles' Doctrine. We have an unwavering commitment to teaching the Apostles' Doctrine. Would you do that? If you haven't done that, would you just repent? And if you don't come under us as elders, go find some elders that you can come under and submit to their leadership as it's commanded to do for all of us that are in the body of Christ. And then would you answer God's call to leadership? I just believe God's calling some of you to be elders and deacons. Some of you are perhaps being called to be teaching elders in the church of Jesus. And it may not be here, but it's wherever God leads you to go. And the church has a tremendous need. Would you answer God's call to leadership if he's calling you to leadership this morning? That's the invitation. How will you respond? How will you respond right now to what the Lord has said to you this morning? Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Through this message, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I extend my hands in thanksgiving for what you're going to do. I extend my hands in thanksgiving for what you're going to do in this local church and through this local church. Lord, not just in my lifetime, but after I'm gone, what you're going to do, I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I can see it, what you're going to do. Now bless, bless, Lord. Bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.